All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today. I wanna start off by saying I uh, appreciate everyone being here on a Friday afternoon and, and joining us for what'll probably be a geeky session here where we talk about hacking. So we're gonna talk about uh, remote workers today. We'll focus on the remote workers because uh, like me, maybe you're still working at home as well. And kind of to that point, I am at home and I have dogs and Amazon. So if you hear my uh, puppers in the background, please forgive them. So lately we've been seeing um, with people that are coming to us, a lot of attacks that have focused on the remote workers. Um, you know, the amount of working from uh, people working from home has gone up exponentially, obviously. Um, and so I want to spend a few minutes today and show you how those attacks are happening and how they're finding your employees to do these attacks. So just to disarm me, I'm not trying to sell you any products or anything today. Um, I don't have a solution for this. Um, you know, we're just, we're gonna talk about what's happening out there and kind of look at the back end. So uh, this isn't something at the end where I come to you and say, oh, it's great, I have a solution for this because I don't. Um, there's plenty of companies out there that make secure solutions for remote workers. Um, and my job is just to make sure you're using those options securely. So I encourage you to head over to our website. We got a ton of free cybersecurity guides, do-it-yourself guides and templates. Um, you know, head over there, see if there's something that might help you out. Um, and if you're interested in, in how we might could help your firm, uh, you know, I encourage you to reach out. Uh, if you mention you're on this webinar, I'll perform, perform a, a free external scan for you guys just so you can see how we work with our clients and, and how we help them. Uh, of course, no gimmicks or obligations tied to that. And just as a quick intro, uh, I know a few of you guys have been on here before. I, I do see some new faces on here. Uh, so my name is Brian Hahn. I'm, I, I, I work at M Tradecraft. Uh, definitely a financial operations geek, and I work as an ethical hacker to uh, SEC and FINRA firms, mostly RIA and hedge funds. Um, I've come up through, you know, kind of the financial industry, both in the operations side on RIAs and hedge funds, um, and then now run M Tradecraft, where we focus purely on cybersecurity intelligence uh, to the financial industry and a couple other verticals as well. So we're going to start and and. When the SEC or FINRA or anyone starts talking about cybersecurity compliance, uh, they talk about threat modeling and, and understanding the risk that your firm is facing. And so right now, that threat model really comes down to about four categories that we track. Uh, of course, there's a government government sponsored hackers or, or state uh, nation state sponsored hackers. Most of them origi originating from North Korea, Russia, Iran, uh, a lot of Eastern European countries in that mix as well. Uh, of course, there's a lot of organized crime affiliates coming out of Eastern Europe, Africa, and Asia. Um, another threat model is, is also employees, whether they're acting maliciously or carelessly, that's uh, a threat vector we see exploited quite a bit. Um, and then there's the opportunistic ha uh, hackers. You know, These are people that they have an exploit and you have a system and, and they happen to uh, match up. So we're going to cover all these today and uh, and talk about how you should be thinking about them. So the battle plan, you know, when we go out and do an engagement with a firm, whether we're doing a vulnerability scan or a penetration test, we pretty much follow the same seven steps. Um, you know, the idea being that we're trying to replicate what a malicious hacker does, and we want to understand how a malicious hacker would would view your firm and your network. And so those seven steps pr pretty much start with uh, information gathering or what we call OSINT, open source intelligence. And that's where we're just gonna go find as much information as we can about your firm, as much sensitive information as we can about your firm. And we're gonna spend a good bit of time on that today. Uh, we're also gonna talk about target discovery and vulner vulnerability mapping. So, you know, I wanna know where your systems are located and then I wanna know what systems, uh, or excuse me, what vulnerability of those systems may be susceptible to. And then, you know, if I can't find vulnerable systems, then we'll pivot to social engineering uh, to try to get into a network and we'll cover that today. Uh, and then there's target exploitation. So, you know, if I've gotten someone to click on a link, I'm going to exploit that computer. 
Uh, we would then move to privilege escalation or pivoting through the network. So once we've compromised a computer, can we become admin on that computer and can we pivot to other parts of the network? Um, and then there's, of course, the attack. So uh, we'll walk through that today and, and talk about how they all come together. So I like to start with this map. So we're all on kind of the same idea of what's what's going on. And, and if you would just kind of ignore the yellow tags here we use this in our presentations to clients these are the things that we go and check audits and security pumps on but um, basically what we want to show is that you know you can think of the intranet block here being a typical office it's going to be made up of workstations and laptops and maybe file servers and they're all connected through a network switch which then heads out to the internet um, and of course, now we're talking about remote offices, which is generally going to be residents, uh, your employees' residents. Um, you know, within that residence, they're going to have a whole host of things that you don't have control over: uh, Alexa devices, ring doorbells, whatever their you know their teenage kids have plugged into the network. And then all of that is going to go through a switch, or in their case, a, a modem and firewalls, and potentially out to the network as well. So the part we're going to be looking at today is how can we break into this network here and take control of these computers so that we can commit a crime. Uh, we're first going to start externally because as we are preparing an attack, we want to be as hands off as possible. We want to leave as small of a fingerprint as possible. And so if we can uh, you know, initiate an attack externally, that's how we're gonna do it. So we're gonna look for vulnerabilities externally. Um, if we can't find vulnerabilities, then we're going to move to social engineering to try to get in that way, consider that like a backdoor uh, so that we can compromise the machine. So I hope that kind of helps understand what we're looking at today and what we're gonna be testing and what we're gonna be breaking into. So, you know, the question is always, what crime do we want to commit, right? Like, what hack are we going to do? And, and quite honestly, I don't think, you know, I know when we start a penetration test, we generally don't know what we're going to be able to uh, to compromise. You know, I don't, I don't start a penetration test and say, I'm going after business email compromise. It just, it happens to be one of those things as we're going through our open source intelligence and our target mapping, you know, we're going to look for vulnerabilities that we can we can take over. So the big one we're seeing right now is business email compromise. If you see all the news going on with the exchange servers, that's a very big deal. Um, you know, these are tens of thousands of systems that have been compromised. Um, and so, you know, these are emails that are lost. Um, you know, Chinese intellectual property theft is real big. Uh, this is how that occurs. Uh, there's ID theft. Um, you know, a lot of you have the KYC requirements and so uh, whenever those came into regulation, you know, you had to start collecting a lot more information about your clients. Uh, so that now has caused you guys to be a treasure trove for ID theft. You know, if I can get copies of passports and driver's license all in one spot, that's definitely a target. Um, ransomware, of course, is big. That's a quick buck. Um, and it's pretty easy for an attacker to uh, infiltrate a network and deploy ransomware. Um, we have several other webinars where we demonstrate those kind of attacks if you're interested. Um, there's also click fraud where, you know, I take over a website and we may compromise a link and send someone to a, um, you know, a replicated web page where they enter their credentials and they, they don't know that it's not a secure service. Um, still credit card data, you know, I know uh, I can't tell right off the bat, but I know we generally have some financial planners in the in the audience. Um, this one's going to be big for you. I know a lot of you guys take credit cards um, they, to pay for financial planning services and that sort of thing. So that is a target with you guys. Um, and, and that's an interesting one because when I talk to clients, the financial planners are usually the ones that think they're not too much at risk where that's actually a, a pretty big one right there. Um, and then there's the, the king daddy, the worst one, and that's when money goes missing. Um, you know, you can think of uh, kind of these top five as being in one category and that's where data goes missing. And if the hacker is good and they cover their, their tracks, you're, you're probably not going to know that data did go missing. Um, on the other hand, when money goes missing, that hurts and people start investigating and people start asking a lot of questions um, and, and it becomes a major show. 
So when we talk about that first stage and the open source intelligence stage, and when we're, we're mapping our attack and when hackers are looking at your network, there's particular information that they're curious to get, right? There, there's certain things that they wanna know. Social security numbers, account numbers, I wanna know social media accounts, credit reports, device information. Are you using Apple's, Macs, uh, Android? Um, and of course, IP addresses, you know, IP addresses being um, you know, where these devices are actually located and how I can communicate with them. So to start the open source intelligence, we do what we call mapping the dark web. And I use past breaches to help look for sensitive information, right? So the way a breach happens is basically, you know, you have a hack that happens, they collect a bunch of data, they try to sell it on the dark web to the highest bidder, Eventually that kind of wears out or the person who bought it leaked it elsewhere and it's for free. Uh, so you now end up with a lot of data that was past breaches that's now floating around for free. So what we wanna do is go out and map those past breaches and see what kind of sensitive information we can get because if we can find usernames and passwords and IP addresses, that puts us a long way uh, towards attacking your remote workers. So let me show you how I do that. When I start these engagements, we're gonna jump over here to a little bit of Python script. And I use one called the harvester. And up here at the top, we have a little command that we told the harvester. Uh, we said, go look at the domain uh, lpl.com. And I'm just picking on LPL here. We would find the same amount of information for any other uh, domain that we looked at. And I said, just spend, uh, go look at the first 20 results on Google, Bing, and DuckDuckGo, which are all search engines, and come back and tell me what host and, and uh, excuse me, usernames that you found. So I ran this previously before the webinar here, just so we didn't have to wait. It takes about two to three minutes for it to run. Uh, but as you can see, it comes back with quite a bit of email addresses and usernames for the lpl.com domain. And so this is to be expected, right? Like this is not sensitive data. This is stuff that is already on search engines because, uh, you know, in general, these people, you know, are entrepreneurial minded. They, you know, they're financial advisors. They've got their email out there because that's a major communication. So we're starting with very public information here, right? Like this isn't, uh, this isn't catastrophic that we found this and, you know, this is definitely open source. So we wanna take this information and see what else can we find about these users. And so what we do is we one by one, we'll take a user and then we go and we start to map the dark web and see what we can find. And eventually that looks like that. So up at the top and what looks like a colorblind test here is where we mapped what data we were able to find about a firm. And this is, a, this is actually a real world example from, um, from one of my clients, but it's been anonymized here. Um, up at the top, we start with those email addresses that we just sourced. The second row of dots are gonna be the different breach databases where I found information with those usernames in there. And then down below that, I will map the information that I was able to pull from those domains or excuse me, from those breaches. So zooming in up here at the top, you can see we have Oscar Martinez and Pam Halpert and Dwight Schrute uh, and several others at lpl.com, Michael Scott, of course. Um, and then down below that, we map the different breaches that we found them in. So, you know, and these are not, you know, these are gonna be uh, services like Adobe, LinkedIn, I'm trying to see what we have on this particular one, uh, LinkedIn, Dropbox, um, Adobe, you know, so these are all systems that a lot of financial advisors use. And if you use them, then you've probably been involved in these breaches. And then down below that, we just map what information were we able to recover in those breaches. Um, and as you can see with these, we found password hints, we found usernames, we found passwords, we found IP addresses, we found the email addresses that we already knew we had to confirm, and then on and on. Income levels, physical addresses, uh, dates of birth, job titles, geographic locations, social media profiles, it literally goes on and on. Um, a lot of times we can pull credit reports. We find a lot of really sensitive information um, about these firms. And so, you know, when we 
can start an attack and we know what usernames your employees are using. We know what passwords they're using and we know what IP addresses are located at. It gives us a lot of information when we go out and do a penetration test. And of course, it gives a malicious hacker everything they need to go find your employees. So that's, you know, this information is out there. Unfortunately, we didn't, we didn't, you know, go to any servers. We didn't go to any unauthorized servers. We simply pulled this information from search engines that had searched through past breaches. So, um, you know, super, super easy to do. So attack one is what I call the massive ISP supplied modem problem, okay? So we, we now know IP addresses and behind those IP addresses at your employees' homes are going to be their modem. Most, of, most employees have gone to Verizon or Charter or, or whoever is the internet service provider, the ISP in your area, and they paid for internet service and they're generally given a modem. The problem is those modems are very vulnerable, okay? So one major problem with them is you as a person, you know, you as an, as an individual user cannot monitor or update that equipment. So you can't log into the back end, at least with the ISPs I know, and tell what version software you're running, uh, at least, you know, through a user portal. Um, and you can't tell when it's updated. And further, even if it was out of date, you don't have the ability to push an update to it to get the latest patches. So in, in, even to start with, the, the equipment ships with a general level of incompetence, both kind of in the way they're configured initially, and then in their ongoing maintenance, the way that patches are pushed to them. Um, and two, we're starting to see a trend, um, Google and Spectrum are kind of leading the way on this, but where you would have a private Wi-Fi router in your home, but in addition to feeding your internal private network, it would also provide public Wi-Fi to people passing by on the street or driving by on your road. And currently we haven't seen the technology and it hasn't been tested. So there's no real reason to, be, to assume that this is being done securely and this is being firewalled. So this is something that we have to look at that's, that's starting to roll out with the ISP supply modems. Uh, the, the good news is, is that this equipment is very inexpensive, generally less than $200. Um, you can go buy your own equipment from Amazon plug it in. Each ISP is going to have a list of, of modems that you can purchase that will work with them. Um, and when you plug that in, then you you now own that modem. You can log in, you can update it, and you can make sure um, that, it, that it is secure. So let's step over back to some Python code, and I'll show you how we go through and, and take over a modem uh, that we want to, uh, that we want to exploit. So this is another bit of Python call, uh, code called router exploit. It does exactly what it says. It exploits routers. So when we started up, we're going to say, uh, you know, show us some scanners that you have. Uh, we chose a scanner called Autopone, which will basically just go through and scan an IP address to try to locate a vulnerability that is in that IP address. Um, and so here we came in and we set the target to 192.168.1.1. And, you, you know, I, I, of course, if you know networks, this is an internal network. This is a, uh, a vulnerable network that we set up internally on purpose so that we can do these kind of demonstrations and show how to exploit things. So to be very clear, this is not an outside computer. This is one that we own that we're, that we're testing for exploits here. So in other words, we're fully authorized mm -hmm. on it. Um, so we did 192.168.1.1, uh, um, and it's just going to go through a list of different vulnerabilities. And any time it finds one that our network is susceptible to, it'll flag it right here with a little plus sign. So there's one vulnerability, and there's another vulnerability. So this one was actually on an internal security network that we do. So if you've seen any of our past stuff, I love taking over surveillance systems. Um, we do a little bit of work with private military and build systems that help them take over uh, surveillance systems and that sort of thing when they're securing areas. So that's, that's a big thing that we like to look at. Um, and so this is a remote code execution on a DVR system that we often go out and exploit. 
And the other one is um, it's on a Linksys router. So this is just a standard off the shelf Linksys router that we have. Uh, there it is. That is susceptible to a remote uh, remote code execution known as the moon. So we're going to put that to the side for a second and revisit it here a little bit later when we talk about exploits and how we go out and actually take over these. We'll look at these two particular vulnerabilities uh, to take over. So, uh, and guys, to say router exploit is free open source software. Anyone can download it and use it. Um, you know, even if you are a CCO and you want to use this to verify that your systems are not vulnerable to this, it's definitely open for you. So the bad news about that is it's very powerful and it's open to hackers as well, right? Like, so they can easily get access to this and run these same kind of tests uh, to see what, what may be vulnerable on your network. So the second attack that we look at, and this has been, so I'm, I'm going basically the top three attacks that we see, and we're starting from attack one being the uh, least uh, intrusive to attack three being the most intrusive, meaning, you know, we're making a, a huge fingerprint. So remote desktop connection exploits are a big one that we see, and these are these are hackers that take over your employee's computer whether they're using like some software like team viewer or log me in or, or whatever software you may be using or if you're using the built-in microsoft remote desktop connection as a basket we just refer to these as remote desktop connections and so when you think about exploiting this there is active exploitation which creates a bigger fingerprint so that is where I already know your IP address. I'm going to go scan that IP address and see if there's remote desktop protocol open so that I can test it for vulnerability. So that is me directly connecting to a network and making a connection, which of course is a fingerprint. Not to say that that can't be hidden and that's not an attack angle, but it's definitely not our easiest. Instead, I wanna focus on the passive side today and show you that because this is definitely the scariest. And what we're going to look at is a program called Shodan.io. And if you think about Google, Google is a search engine. And if I want to go find the latest blogs on financial planning, I go to Google, I type in financial planning, and it ranks the list of blogs that contain that topic. Shodan is a search engine for things. So for things connected to the Internet. So let me just jump to Shodan here and I can show you exactly what we're talking about. So this is Shodan. Uh, let me zoom in a little bit, might give you a little bit better, uh, better view here. Um, and it's a search engine. So we can go in and, and I did this beforehand just so we know we can look at something. But if I go in and do the search and say, show me every device that has port 3389 open, which is the port that remote desktop traditionally communicates over a few other programs do different, but we're just looking at 3389 for this example. And then I said, show me all the ones that have uh, the word Schwab in them, okay? Um, and I chose Schwab because this was actually one of the few that didn't show a true vulnerability. This looks to be uh, someone's remote desktop who has the last name Schwab or that's their login. Uh, it, they're also on a Windows 7 machine. Uh, you, so in Shodan here, you can we're literally looking at a screenshot of their desktop and their login because remote desktop is just bleeding out into the world. It's not properly secured. Um, and so, you know, we can see that they're on Windows 7. We know that's going to be a very vulnerable machine. It hadn't been updated in a long time. So just from a quick Shodan search, we can passively find people who, you know, if we are particularly gifted at a hack or an exploit and we have become crafted at deleting everything about our fingerprint, well, this is where we're going to come to find a victim that fits our particular craft so that we, you know, can get away with the crime. So this is why it's very important to make sure that you're doing those network scans and you don't have employees that just have remote desktop bleeding out into the world because they will be found. Um, here's another search where uh, we did port 3389 and did for the word investment. Um, you know, here's a company, ABS Investment Management. They've obviously thought about security because they put this, this screen that you have to click and acknowledge before you can access it, but they haven't done anything to actually secure it. 
Um, same, same with this company. Uh, this looks to be uh, maybe a hedge fund in Nigeria, perhaps. Um, so on and on, right? Here's another one. I, and I can tell you exactly what's going on here because this is, this is a big problem that I see over and over. Uh, this is going to be a server. I'm going to guess here is your investment advisor with this login. Here's your admin login. Here's the advisor login. Here's their IT person that's supposed to be securing their network. And, you know, convenience and security do not go hand in hand. IT companies, remote IT companies want convenience. They want to be able to access your network remotely and they want to be able to do it easily. So oftentimes they don't set things up to be the most secure because it makes their job harder. Um, and so whenever I whenever I have a group that comes on and has an IT firm, um, and, and is wanting us to do an audit, it almost like, it's almost like we want to give them a discount because we know it's going to be an easier target to get in because, you, I mean, the attack surface is, is widened so much. So anyway, you can kind of see that in real time uh, of what's going on there. Um, and then the last I'll show you, you can even do like an image search on Shodan. So here I said, uh, and so this, this is kind of interesting too. I just did a search and said, show me everything report 3389 open. Um, in my home city here of San Antonio. And right now we have 518 results. You can see I can just scroll through them and they'll go on and on. Um, this used to be about 10. So before COVID, when we go and do these searches, we'd be lucky if we get 10. And, and sometimes I'd even have to change the city if there weren't any that happened to be open that day. Um, so it's, you know, I'm sure results are similar everywhere, but that, that attack surface has grown significantly. Um, so that's Shodan, right? So, um, you know, once I see, um, okay, you know, I'm going after, um, you know, such and such server here, I know its IP address, I probably already know some usernames, and I probably already know uh, some passwords for it. And so I'm going to go and just start attacking that and see what I can find from that. So that's a remote desktop connection. Of course, that's very bad. So if I can take over your employee's computer, um, I can do whatever they can do on that computer. So if they're logged in to Schwab or Fidelity, I'm logged in to Schwab or Fidelity. If they're logged into your trading platform and cashiering, I'm logged into trading and cashiering. Um, you know, it, the computer doesn't distinguish between a remote desktop connection and um, and a local user, especially if, if configured properly. Um, so again, it's not to say that remote desktop is bad. You know, it's not to say don't use it. It's just to say, if you use it, you better make sure it's it's secure. And so, you know, let's say I'm a malicious hacker and I've got my target and I've, I've located every system and I've located every IP address and I can't find a vulnerability. And, and that happens quite a bit, right? Hopefully you guys are keeping your systems up to date and we can't find a vulnerability to get in when we're doing these pen tests. Well, that's when we would move to phishing, right? And phishing is when we attempt to get an employee of the firm to click on an email and get them to open something. Click on a link. So one thing I'll say is I, I do believe that phishing training and paying for fake phishing campaigns is a complete waste of money because they do not reflect the real world attacks that we see clients face. Um, instead, we think that as chief compliance officers and as owners, you need to be having you know, real world conversations about what phishing means. If you have employees that post everything on social media, that will be used against them. Um, it, you know, we've, I, I, I won't go into the stories here. We've definitely covered stories um, on phishing attacks and other ones where social media was a, was a, you know, a key pivot point. But ultimately, real world attacks focus on two things. And one is greed and the other is fear. Um, fear is generally going to focus around uh, revealing something you don't want revealed. Oftentimes, it's adultery. Um, one of the real world problems that we faced for several years and we still see going on is there's a website called Ashley Madison uh, that promoted adultery. They were hacked in their entire database. Breach, uh, data breach was leaked. So it's pretty easy to go into that data breach and just search for words like financial or bank or hedge fund or whatever keywords you want to find and find people that use their work email address to sign up for these services. And you now have someone 
that's probably a pretty large target for blackmail and we'll click on a link responding to fear. Um, so that's the other one that we see. Um, the one I'm about to demonstrate goes on greed and I see this all the time. You basically, uh, well here, let's just dive in and, and actually take a look at this. I'll show you what it looks like. So this is the social engineering toolkit. This is another Python script that helps us go out and, and do these kind of penetration attacks. Um, and so once we get into it, it's going to give us uh, a menu down here that we can choose from uh, that will help us in this, these kind of attacks. And so we're going to select social engineering attack. And we're going to do an infectious media generator. And so basically, we want to look at file format exploits. Yep. Got lost here. One second. Here we go. So this is where we want to be. So we want to create a file format payload. So we'll come in here and we see that we have a bunch of different formats that we can use. This is the big one right here taking a PDF and embedding it with a .exe file. And when you open it, that .exe file executes and it's probably gonna give me a shell code on your computer. So this is a big one because as an industry, we've been trained that Adobe PDF is safe and, and I think ethical hackers and cybersecurity people will have quite the opposite um, opinion. But this is one where we see attacks where someone will take uh, they'll go online and they'll download like a Fidelity brokerage statement or Schwab brokerage statement, whatever the case may be. And they'll try to, you know, maybe they'll doctor it up and, you know, make it a five to $10 million account. And then they, they bring that document, that PDF, and they come in here and we can, you know, choose option 13. Um, we're going to use our own PDF for an attack. So here's where we would put in the path to it. And now it's going to give us several different, uh, seven different options for attacks that we can embed into this PDF. So depending on what I know about your system, that's going to depend on what attack vector I choose here. But ultimately, what I'm relying on is that I'm going to send you an email and say something like, you know, dear advisor, uh, I currently have $10 million with Fidelity. I haven't been pleased with their service. Are you currently taking new clients? If so, would you please look at my brokerage statement and tell me, uh, you know, what would be our first steps? You know, should we have a conversation about allocation, whatever the case may be? That's where you get greed, right? Because if you can put someone into a fear or greed mindset, they're going to click on that link. All any cybersecurity training they've gone, they've had will go out the window and they'll click on the link. It's not like getting an email from a prince who's trying to hide millions and wants to transfer millions to you to help him. Right. Like that sets off people's alarms. They're smarter than that now. So, you know, real world phishing attacks, they're they're targeted, they're researched, they're going to go through your social media, they're going to find your spouse's name. Um, it's 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 devastating. And so to me, it's always very important to be having those conversations with your employees, because when someone wants in, they are, you know, with just a little bit of research, they're going to figure out a way uh, to get into that network through phishing. So, what, you know, we can get in a, a, a bunch of different ways, you know, say we, we scanned the, the targets that we found and we found a vulnerability, uh, whether it's like that remote code execution on the DVR security system or the Linksys, or we've gotten uh, someone to click on a link and we're now into the network. Um, so now we want to exploit that machine and then pivot to other things in that network to see that what we can control. And so we're going to jump again to uh, to some Python script for that. This is a program called Metasploit, and Metasploit's kind of industry wide um, uh, industry wide standard for exploit software to go in and take uh, control of systems. Um, it's heavily backed by volunteer programmers, and it has a uh, significant number of exploits available to us currently. Uh, 20, a little over 2,100 exploits on different systems. So, you know, what we would do is we would come into, now that we've kind of mapped our network and we know what exploits, um, we'd come in and say search, um, you know, we'll search here for the moon. And this is that same vulnerability that we found in our router exploit uh, scan. So we knew the IP address, we scanned it with router exploit. Router exploit said, 
hey, this is susceptible to the moon, which is a remote code execution. And so now we know the IP address, we know it's vulnerable to this. What we're gonna do is come into Metasploit and execute this particular vulnerability, this command line injection into that IP address. Uh, and you can see this even ranks as an excellent exploit uh, within, um, within Metasploit. So that would be something we can go after. You know, similar we can do, um, we do a search for RDP here. Let me back out just a little bit. So wait, there we go. Um, it picked up a little bit more. So we do RDP, you know, we can start to see the particular exploits that are built for remote desktop protocol or remote desktop um, executions and that sort of thing. And, you know, it'll give us a rank here. So this is a very powerful module. You know, literally I can pull up, um, once we know what exploit it's vulnerable to, we can pull this up. It's already got the exploit built into it. We can just plug in our servers, our command servers, plug in the target IP addresses and hit go and have it take over that system so that we can start pivoting through. Um, and, you know, once we do that, once we're in the network, it's, you know, it's ours. We're going to figure out what's going on. We're going to start watching traffic on it uh, quietly, you know, to figure out what can be done and, and what can be manipulated within that network. So ultimately, that's, you know, that's pretty much the steps you go down, um, you know, when looking at these remote code execution attacks. Um, you know, Metasploit's going to run shells in the background. Um, it's pretty easy to bypass um, uh, antivirus or malware. It's pretty easy to get past that if you know what you're doing. Um, you know, because if you if you think about those systems, they're they're set up to detect templates, right? Like they see the same exploit over and over. Uh, but if you actually pull up that exploit and change a little bit, it's pretty easy to to slip through that to slip through those. So that is overview of of what we're seeing. Um, with remote employees coming on um, and the problems that we're seeing them face in terms of keeping their networks secure. Um, so, you know, I hope that's helpful. You know, I hope that kind of gives you an idea of what you should be thinking out when thinking about the risk that uh, your, your uh, external employees may be facing and having these conversations with them, um, you know, so that they know what to be looking for. So, that's it guys I you know I thank you for coming out um, it, it really does mean a lot to me I appreciate you guys coming out and your attention and, and participating in this I have a couple questions up here I'm gonna dive into here in a second um, if you have any please feel free to, to throw some questions in there I'll definitely address them at this time um, anything that might have come up um, and of course as a reminder please stop by our website we have a ton of guides and um, templates and videos and all kinds of stuff on there it's there's no clickbait you're not gonna have to enter your email address or anything like that it's all there free for you to use um, and then of course please contact us if you're interested in having that scan um, we'll do an, an external scan if you want to see what's vulnerable or um, if you want to do a dark web map and see what sensitive information might be out there about your firm um, I'm definitely happy to do that Okay, so what, uh, one question is, how effective are commercial antivirus? That is, that is a great question. Um, I don't think, and people will say I'm wrong, and maybe they have their opinions, and, and I definitely have mine, but I don't believe there is a better antivirus out there other than the free Windows Defender program. And here's my basis for that. If I'm going to protect the system, I have to have access to that source code. I have to see that source code in order to protect it. If I can't see the source code, then I'm not fully protecting a system because I'm working more on a templated approach and I'm not gonna catch all attacks. So because of that, Windows Defender is the only one that has access to that source code. And it's, they're, they're also, I mean, it's, it's a Microsoft product. They're pretty invested in keeping their, their, uh, their network and their computers safe. And there's a huge workforce behind that product that keeps it up to date. Um, we see very fast patching coming through that before we see uh, through other products. So my favorite is Windows Defender for antivirus. Um, I do like having a, an, an aftermarket anti-malware program. Um, I've used malware bytes on Windows in the past. I, I can't say if it's the best or the worst. I've, I've had good experiences with it. Um, I know there's some others out there too. So I do like having that. That's 
one thing I feel that Windows Defender does not do a good job of is analyzing malware. Um, and so I, I like having some of those other solutions out there. Um, and so, you know, you know, like malware bytes or whatever, Norton, I'm sure, has a product. I think all of those, you know, rank pretty equally on that. So typical cost of analyzing hacks, cleaning up systems, and notifying clients. So on average, it's about $380 per person, assuming that no money went missing. We're assuming a data breach. We're assuming you have to buy credit monitoring services. You have to bring in a forensic analyst. Um, which we don't do that, by the way. So I'm I'm not pitching services here. I always like to be clear about that. Um, and we don't work with anyone that does, but it, it's super expensive. Um, you know, you're going to have to report it to the authorities. There's no telling what kind of investigation that's going to entail, if any. I mean, if you even get a phone call back, quite honestly. Um, in, in my experience, you're generally not going to have the authorities get involved unless money goes missing. And then when that happens, they, they come on like vultures. Um, so the cost can be generally, it, it's all over. We've got an infographic up on it, but you can generally think, um, you know, I think a good estimate's between 350 and $400 per person in order to clean that up and secure that everything uh, has been crafted. Um, how effective, here's another question, is how effective is URL defense for phishing? Um, you know, I it, it depends. Um, phishing comes in two flavors. Uh, there's phishing and there's what's known as spear phishing. And what I showed you today would actually classify as spear phishing, where we know the target, we know exactly how we're going to exploit them, and we're going directly at them, say, with that PDF with an embedded exploit. Um, a URL defense system is going to be useless against that because it's going to be coming from a server that I've crafted specifically for this purpose. So that IP address isn't going to be registered in any malicious domains or anything like that. It's going to be a fresh cut. Um, you know, that's my fresh target. So it's not going to be effective in that. Now, you know, it, it is effective in what I call, you know, the, the Prince emails. So, um, you know, if you have a mass email that went out to a million people from a mailing list and, you know, out of that million people, and, and that's the bet, right? Like if, if I'm a hacker sitting in, in some third world country and I'm just looking for an easy hack, um, it's super easy for me to get access to a million emails. And it doesn't matter how stupid my message is or how crazy the claim is, somebody is going to click on that link. It's a numbers game. Someone out of that million is going to click on the link, even if it's accidentally, right? Like they're trying to swipe it on their phone or whatever and hit it. So it's a numbers game. The URL defense uh, programs are pretty crafty at catching those. Um, you know, once you start sending out large... Um, uh, large amounts of traffic over email servers, they generally tend to wisen up and stop that. So um, it can be effective to stop, you know, just massive, uh, massive phishing campaigns, but they're not very effective for the targeted spear phishing campaigns like we discussed today. So one question is, what questions should we ask our third party IT provider to ensure our firm's antivirus and malware software is secure enough? So my question is, you shouldn't have to ask them anything they should be sending you as part of your compliance program once a month at a minimum, sending you the documentation to say, hey, we did vulnerability scans. We tested all of our systems. Um, you know, we made sure that everything is updated. Um, we made sure antivirus was running. Here is what we captured. These are all reports that you're required to be captioning in your compliance program. Now, if you're gonna hire an outside IT vendor, that needs to be a discussion on who is responsible for producing those reports. Because you're generally gonna find that the IT company is not gonna give you vulnerability scans because that is going to create so much work for them that it's just not something they're gonna entertain. And think about an IT company, okay? I'm, I'm an IT company provider. And I want to provide, um, I, I'm talking hypothetically here, you know, I want to deploy my Office 365 uh, package to as many people as I can. And that's how I make my money. When you do that, they set up templates. And so anytime you change one of those templates to fit a particular firm's needs, say they need vulnerability scanning, whereas the ice cream shop down the road might not. 
anytime you change that template, you make it exponentially harder for that IT firm to secure that network. So that's the big problem. So the questions you need to be asking them are, what are you doing to actively monitor for vulnerabilities? What are you doing to make sure that our servers, our modems, our workstations, our VOIP equipment, what are you doing to make sure it's all up to date? And there's a host of different software out there that can do that. We use one called Nessus, which goes in and scans the network and will automatically give us that kind of insight. Um, there's a company called Rapid7 that has a, a, a program that's, that's really effective. There's a free one called OpenVAS. Um, so there's a ton of software out there to do this. Basically, what you want them doing is sending you the reports from where they're doing this work to ensure that your network is secure. You're probably going to have a hard time getting them. And that's often where we step in to provide kind of that third party confirmation. But anyway, that's what you should be asking them. They, as part of their service, should be sending you at least once a month. I mean, no, no longer than once a quarter, complete vulnerability scans where they say, hey, you know, these are the systems that we're responsible for. And this is where we've gone through and scanned using some third party software to confirm that everything is up to date. So I hope that helps, um, you know, kind of thinking about it. Um, a lot of times it's, you know, and as part of your vendor due diligence, kind of diving back into that too, um, you should definitely have received privacy statements and cybersecurity statements from your IT provider. So you need to know how they're handling that kind of data that they are entrusted with. Um, and so part of that should be having vulnerability scans and, and requiring them to do that. Um, if you have an IT company and you don't have a vendor due diligence agreement with them that highlights that type of stuff, that's one of those things you can head over to my, uh, you can head over to my website and I've got a template on there that you can download uh, that is just an agreement with any outside vendor that has access to your data. And one of the things that's gonna require them to send you those kind of reports on there, so. Um, anyway, hope that helps and uh, gives you some insight into to what's going on out here in the remote hacking world and also how you guys can be thinking about it uh, to protect your network. So um, anyway, guys, thank you so much for your time today. I greatly appreciate it. Um, any questions come up or if you want to take advantage of that external scan, uh, you know, reach out to us or, or at least head over to our website and take a look at what we have there. I think you'll find something that'll be useful to you. So. Thank you again. I hope you have a great weekend and enjoy the rest of your Friday.